I love the hops plant. It's a beautiful plant, it's easy to grow, and it gives us beer, or at least beer as we think of it today. Beer today is made with four main ingredients, hops, barley, yeast, and water. But in the past, the beer did not contain hops. It contained something called a Groot instead, G-R-U-I-T. We don't know exactly what Groot is. We know it probably contained wild rosemary and bog myrtle, but it didn't contain hops. Now, b before the 8th century AD, people didn't use hops in beer, but they knew what hops was. In the ancient Greek and Roman world, they would use hops for things like medicine and flavoring of food, but not for beer. Then a great discovery happened. In some monasteries in modern day France in the 8th century, they experimented with putting hops in beer instead of Groot, and they liked what they found. They liked the taste it gave, and maybe more importantly, they found that it helped preserve the beer even better than the Groot did. And so, in certain select areas, mostly monasteries, slowly over time, in places like France and Germany, they started replacing Groot with hops, and it got more popular. And then during the Reformation era, this was a time when the Groot was taxed by the Catholic Church. So if you were a brewer and you didn't want any of your money to go to the Catholic Church, you would use hops instead of the Groot. And eventually the hops became so popular that no one used Groot anymore and today we don't even really know exactly what it is. Now one of the great things about hops is that it allowed people to produce a beer that uh, would last longer, would, would be fresh longer, better and safer to drink. So you have to remember that in the past, water was unsafe to drink. People didn't want to drink it because it had microorganisms. They didn't know that. They just knew it made them sick. But they knew if they drank beer instead, they didn't get sick as much. The brewing process and the hops killed the microorganisms. And so even children centuries ago would sometimes drink beer every day all day long and if you're doing that what you want is a weaker beer the problem was a weaker beer tended to be less safe unless you loaded it up with hops and so people learned that they could drink a weaker beer and it was still safe as long as they used more hops in it and so when the pilgrims left Europe to go to the new world on the Mayflower they could drink in beer the whole way even children and one of the reasons they decided to settle at Plymouth Rock instead of anywhere else was because they ran out of beer on the ship. So uh, one of our most famous moments in American history is founded on the premise of a beer run. So today's lecture is also going to be about the hops plant. We're going to learn about the plant itself, but more importantly, we're going to learn how it's used in beer. And I've got for you because we're actually going to go into Iron Monk Brewery film the lecture in here and actually brew a and to the brewer. So let's get started. But before we get started, I want to give you another little tidbit of hops in history. One of the most famous beers today, one I particularly love, are things we call IPA. One of my famous favorite beers here is the Payne County Imperial IPA. But where did the name come from? IPA stands for India Pale Ale. And that name came from, you know, England used to have India as a colony. And the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, was also the Empress of India. And so they would ship soldiers from England to India. And that was a long uh, voyage, and the sailors needed beer on the way. Sailors wouldn't be happy without their beer. And the problem they had was the voyage was so long that the beer would spoil on the way. So they needed to come up with a beer that would last the whole route. And what they learned is that if you make a beer and put a lot of hops in it, that it would make the beer last. The beer would go all the way from England to India, and that's why they called it India Pale Ale, or as we just say today, IPAs. So this is a hops plant. This is a hops plant that's been growing by my front door all summer. While hops are usually grown in the Pacific Northwest, I've grown them in lots of different locations in Oklahoma. Semi-shady spots, very sunny spots, good soil, bad soil, and they can actually be a bit like a weed. They can spread through rhizomes and just spread everywhere, kind of like a kudzu can. The 
value of hops comes in its flowers, these pretty little green flowers. And within these flowers are resins. And those resins, when released into the beer, it helps preserve the beer and it also imparts distinct flavors. Now the best resins in hops comes from the female flower. So a hop plant, some are male, some are female. The best resins come from female plants, in particular, unfertilized female flowers. And so hops are in the same plant family as cannabis. And just like cannabis, you want unfertilized female flowers. With hops, you want unfertilized female flowers. And the hops plant, they grow really, really tall. They're one of the fastest growing plants in the world. But people say the only thing that grows faster is the bamboo. And they can grow very tall. And they're a bine, not a vine. So they're a bine, B-I-N-E, not a vine, V-I-N-E. And the difference is a bine is going to climb structures by having a really sturdy stalk and, and twirling around it as it grows. Whereas a vine is going to grow by attaching to things through its suckers and tendrils. It's uh, middle of September right now. These hops have been growing by the front door of my house all summer and they're really dry now and they're just starting to turn brown and so this is the optimal time to harvest it. And there's a number of different ways you can harvest it and use it. You can just pick off the flowers and you can just take the flowers fresh and throw it into the wart. That's called wet hopping. What, what is mostly done though is the flowers are made into pellets and they're, well, they're dried first, then smashed into pellets and then frozen and it's usually the pellets that they add. Now I grew, the, I grew these hops plants from a seed. You normally don't ever do that. I was just doing it for fun so why not? Uh, the use, reason you don't want to do that is if you grow a hops plant from a seed, you don't know exactly what the genetics are going to be like, so you don't know exactly what the, its contribution to the beer will be. Most all hops, or virtually all hops grown for beer, are cloned from existing plants that we know are good. So let's take the Cascade hop. To me, the Cascade hop is America's greatest contribution to the brewing industry. And it was formed by, they were, they had, there was a breeding program in the 70s at Oregon State University and they identified this one plant that was really, really good. It was produced, it had a great aroma to it. And so they said, this is a great plant, we're going to name it Cascade Hops. And then to replicate it, you clone it. Now hops can produce by seeds, but they also have rhizomes. Those are underground stems that start from the base of the plant and it just travels on the gr ground and a new plant with identical genetics pops up a little further away. And so when you had this one cascade plant that was great, you just snip some of its rhizome, go somewhere else and plant it, and you have a brand new cascade hops plant with identical genetics and so you know exactly what its chemical contribution to the beer will be. And so this hops that I grew from a seed, it doesn't have a name, it can't have a name, we don't know what its genetics are. But if you have a hops that does have a name, it's because you cloned it from an existing variety. Beer is made from four primary ingredients. There's malted barley, hops, water, and yeast. Let's start with malted, malted barley. To make malted barley, you just start with the barley seed, just the seed right off the barley plant, and then you put it in an environment where it's moist and just the right temperature so the seed will start to sprout. And as soon as it starts to sprout, you immediately dry it off and you get it really dry and roast it just a little bit. And what you get there is something called malted barley. And you do that so it's in a form so that when we put it in a wart later, it will be ready for the enzymes. It gets the starches in the barley in the right form for the enzymes to convert it to sugar. Now, and so all of the alcohol in beer comes from turning this malted barley into sugar, which the yeast then eat and convert to alcohol. Now, another role that malted barley has is providing different taste and different colors in beer 
through specialty malts through the roasting process. So remember how we said we had this malted barley that was just dried off some. Well, if you want a darker beer with kind of a roasted flavor, maybe something like a stout or a porter, what you can do, you can take that malted barley and just roast it. The same way you would coffee, you just heat it and roast it more. And what you get there is a specialty malt, a roasted malted barley, and while you can't get that many sugars from it to convert it to alcohol, what you end up with is a darker malted barley and that's what makes beer dark and that's what gives it certain taste and so when you buy a beer that's a dark color that doesn't have anything to do with the alcohol content a lot of times darker beers are actually weaker what it means is that some of the malted barley you use was roasted and once you have your malted barley you'll put it in a cracker like this and it just cracks the malted barley some and it sends it up a chute and then you'll see in the next step where we add it with water such that the enzymes in the barley will convert the, starch, the starches in malted barley into sugar. After all the enzymes in the malted barley have converted all the starches into sugar, you have what we call a wort. And a wort is just a really sugary liquid. The sugars come from the malt. And if you drink it, it tastes like a light, a light syrup. That's what it is, a sugar mixture. And what you do with your wort then is you want to boil it really good, 60 to 90 minutes. And you have to boil it because in addition to all those sugars you have in your wort, you have lots of bacteria that you don't want. So you want to kill all that bacteria, then later add the yeast that you want in there. And so you're boiling it for 60 to 90 minutes, let's say 90 minutes. That's when you add the hops. And there are two different ways of adding hops at this point. One is at the beginning of the bowl. And that's when you use bittering hops. So let's say we're gonna boil this wort for 90 minutes and we just started it. Maybe now I'll start adding some bittering hops. And as the name implies, those hops are gonna impart a bitter taste in the beer. And you have to put this at the beginning of the bowl because you know, the hops has little resins, little oils in the flowers, and that's what gives it its taste and, and preservatives. And for those oils to really dissolve in the warp mixture, you have to boil it at least 60 minutes. And so you're going to put the bittering hops in there, let it boil for a good 60 minutes. Those are the hops that's going to impart a bitter flavor and preserve the beer, help preserve the beer. Then towards the end of the bowl, you start to add the aromatic hops. So let's say we're going to boil it for a total of 90 minutes and we're at the 80 minute mark. Well now we can take some different types of hops and add that to the wort. And those are the aromatic hops. What those are going to do is that's going to impart other types of flavors and it's going to create different types of aromas. So when you drink an IPA and you and you smell that distinct IPA aroma, that comes from the aromatic hops. And of course, there are certain types of hops that you use at the beginning of the bowl for bittering hops, certain types of hops that you use towards the end, depending on what type of beer you're trying to make. After you bowl your wort for a good 90 minutes, then you want to stop the bowl and you want to cool it down as quickly as possible. You're going to send it through some copper tubes with water surrounding it. Get it really cool really fast. Then you're going to add your yeast. Then you're going to cut it off from any oxygen. And what happens there is that yeast is in this liquid where there's nothing but this, just lots of sugar for it to eat. And the yeast is going to eat that sugar, converting it to alcohol, which you keep, and carbon dioxide, which you let off.
Once you've got your wort with the hops in it that you want, you add your yeast to it and the yeast are ready to eat the sugars in the wort and convert it to alcohol and carbon dioxide. But you got to make sure that oxygen doesn't interact with the with the wort as it's fermenting. And so you put it in a big tank like this and here the yeast will do their work. And while it's in here, the yeast is gonna convert all the sugars to alcohol and then the carbon dioxide is going to be released out the top and it's gonna come through the tube here and be released into a bucket with water. It's in water such that air doesn't escape back up the tube. So we talked about how you can use bittering hops by adding at the beginning of the bowl of the wort and aromatic hops where you add it at the end of the bowl of the wort. There's two other ways. One is you can do wet hopping where you take fresh hops. So I just harvested these hops just three hours ago. Usually the hops are dry before you add it, but you can use wet hops by taking the fresh hops and add them on at any stage of the beer production process. And then a fourth way is called dry hopping. So let's suppose we're making a beer here and suppose it's fully fermented. All the yeast have already turned most of the sugars into alcohol. We can then take either some whole hop flowers or hop pellets and just throw it in there and let the hops just sit in there for maybe a week or so. Dry hops, it just gives beer a different flavor than it would have if you didn't have it. So remember, when we're fermenting the beer, the yeast are turning the sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide, but we're releasing the carbon dioxide. But then when you drink a beer, it's carbonated, right? And so you've got to add the carbon back in. When I used to brew beer at home, what I'd do is I'd take individual bottles of beer, I'd add the fermented beer into it, and then I'd add a little bit of sugar into it, and then add some more yeast, and I'd cap it, and I'd let a little more fermentation go on in the bottle and it will carbonate the beer. Now, of course, you've got to do it just right or the bottles will explode and I've had bottles explode before. So what a brewery is going to do, they're going to pump beer into a container and they're just going to inject it with carbon dioxide to get the precise carbon dioxide that they want. There are two main types of beer, ale and lager, and they both can be made in a tank like this. The difference is the types of yeast you use and the temperature in which they're cooked. Uh, the ale yeast will mostly sit on the top of the warts and convert the starches to sugar at the top, and it'll be brewed at a temperature of around 70 degrees, whereas a lager, the yeast there will mostly operate on the bottom of the wort, and it needs a temperature of about 50 degrees. Now that we've learned all about how beer is produced, especially how hops are used in beer, I want you to meet the head brewer here at Ironmont Brewery, Sean. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give him three of my favorite beers here at Ironmont Brewery, and he's gonna tell us the strategy about how he decides how much hops of what type of hops to use in each beer recipe. So the first beer is the milk stout beer. So our milk stout beer, we don't want it to be too aggressive on the bitter, but the main hop we use for this are bittering hops. Um, and we don't add too much because we want it to be balanced, we still want it to be sweet, and we want the roasty toasted notes that the malt produces to be the most prominent flavor that you get from this beer. And the second beer is my favorite beer in the whole world, Exit 174, a rye pale ale. And she's got a good head on her. So our rye pale ale, we want both aromatic and bittering properties from our hops. So we add a healthy amount of bittering hops during the boil. And 
after fermentation, we add a, a, a good amount of hops for a dry hopping to produce the aromatic uh, floral characteristics you get in the exit. And the last is the nine, which I'm guessing has the most different varieties of hops than any other beer here. That's correct. So our nine is named based off a, a Norse god, and he had nine daughters. And what we did with this beer, we did nine varieties of hops. And this beer in particular, it doesn't have a lot of bitterness, yet it's extremely floral. So there is a small amount of hops added during the boil for bittering, very small amounts. But during fermentation and post-fermentation, we add a very heavy amount of hops so that you get the extreme amount of, of citrus and, and tropical fruit notes that you get from this beer. So if this post-fermentation, is that dry hopping? That is dry hopping. Okay, awesome. and, and during fermentation, that's called primary hopping. Okay, awesome, thank you. Perfect. Perfect. That was great. Awesome.